test review day one of chapter two. And this is third period. So let's see. Um, there's a couple things that I did realize after first period, and that was that one of the pages didn't copy. You guys are missing numbers two, three, eight, and nine. So two and three, I'll just have you copy from the board today. Eight and nine, I have the sheet printed for it. I will print it and give it to you tomorrow so that you have it. You can do those tomorrow night, and then we'll review them on Wednesday. Okay, so trying to solve that problem too. All right, this test is given over two days. So Tuesday and Thursday of this week, you'll be testing. Monday and Wednesday, we're reviewing. Day one consists of five problems, and a, calcul a calculator is not permitted on day one. Um, though it says five problems, one of them has three problems, A, B, C, and both. You know, so it, there's really more than five problems, truly, but, you know, it does, it only is numbered one through five, okay? And day two consists of six problems and two bonus questions. A calculator will be permitted on this section, though it's only going to help you on two of the problems. So on that day, even in the review on Wednesday, I'll tell you which two problems, okay? Questions before we get going? Okay, so um, I started out writing this going, choose a problem, and then I decided, you know what, let me just make it, since I had to write most of the problems, let me just break it up by period and say, here's period one, here's review, here's period two, period three, period four. Because then, if you guys want to tonight study these, you could go through and you could do the other classes and then watch their videos to check the answers, or just pull up the notes, that might be even faster. But if you get stuck on one, feel free to watch all the videos, okay? Um, and then um, your class here is um, this piecewise function f of x equals, and then the first part is 4x plus 8, or the square root of that. The second part is 7x minus 5. And can you just put a little equal sign underneath that um, less than right there and make it less than or equal to? All right, so the first question is, is f continuous at the indicated value? And so your indicated value was at x equals 2. In order to tell if it is continuous there, you have to plug a 2 into both of these functions, both parts, both the left side of the function and the right side of the function. Because if the left and right side are the same, then that means it would be continuous. All right? So for part A, when I plug the 2 into that first part, I have the square root of h plus h, which is the square root of 16, or 4. And for the second part, I have 7 times 2, which is 14 minus 5, and 14 minus 5 is 9. So these two things right here are not the same. Therefore, it is not continuous at x equals 2. Any questions on that part at all? Okay. The second part then says find the average rate of change. Now, what does average rate of change mean? Slope, right. So it means I need two points. And what they're giving me here is they're giving me two x values, negative 2 and positive 5. Well, the negative 2 happens to be between, it, it happens to be right here at the end point of this one, so I need to plug it into this one right here. That gives me the square root of, uh, negative 8 plus 8, which is the square root of 0, which is 0. And then the 5 needs plugged into this one. That gives me 35 minus 5, which is 30. So once I find the two points, I then just plug it into my slope formula. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, and minus negative there means plus positive. So I end up getting 30 sevenths. If that would reduce, reduce it, but average rate of change is 30 sevenths. Uh, can I write that as 4 and 2 sevenths? Absolutely, that's fine. Okay. Um, you won't have a calculator, so you won't be tempted to write it as a decimal at all, so that question doesn't even come up. So what do you think about question number one? So this one here really is not a huge calculus problem. It's just a vocabulary question. Do you know what continuous is? And do you know what average rate of change is? Any questions on that? All right, so number two, uh, you guys did not have. So here we go. It says the limit, 
as x approaches infinity of f of x equals negative 3, the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x equals negative 3, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side is infinity, and the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side is positive infinity. I know you didn't have this one, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is negative 3. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is negative 3. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left side of f of x is infinity. And the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side of f of x is infinity. So I guess what I would do here is I would definitely start with an x and y axis. Some things that they're referring to are when x is 2 and also when y is negative 4. So this says the limit as x approaches both the right and left side. Oh, sorry. Thank you. The right and left side is negative 3. My bad on that. We don't need to go to 4. Okay. So... At negative 3, it's saying this is the end behavior. It's a horizontal asymptote. But here's what I don't know. I don't know if the left side is coming from down here and approaching it or if it's coming from up here and approaching it. So really light with my pencil on my paper, I would kind of sketch both and then go back so I can erase one of them. Okay. Same at this end. I don't know if it's coming down here or up like this. I just know the ends, both the right and left end, are both approaching the y value of negative 3. Now the other thing is, as x approaches 2, so here's 2 right here, from the left side is infinity. So it's going up here from the left side. And it's approaching 2 from the right side is also going to infinity. Well, now you can start to see that this here is going to connect to this, and that this here is going to connect to this. And so these parts that I had down underneath are the things that I could erase. So it's like you're building a graph. Okay. <laughs> Questions on that one? All right, the next one then, question number three, and this is the one that has three problems, okay? So um, the first class chose number four, number 11, and number 16. So how about we choose, you know, one of these others, like number five, and let's do number 12, and we'll do number 15, okay? Just so that it's different than theirs. All right, so number five, it asks you the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x squared minus 9 over x squared plus 2x minus 3. So you have two options here. You can either start factoring, reducing, and then plugging the number in, or you can plug the number in, and as long as the denominator doesn't equal 0, you would be done with the problem. So I think I have it here where... One way it would work, one way, and the other it wouldn't, you know. I kind of have it so that you can see it different ways. Uh, but if I plug the negative 3 into the numerator, I end up getting 0. Because negative 3 squared is 9, and 9 minus 9 is 0. Now, as long as the denominator is not 0, I'm okay. When I plug it in here, I get 9 minus 6 minus 3. That gives me 0, so that's not okay. All right, I can't just plug it in there. For this one, I'm going to have to factor and reduce. So, let me kind of pull it over here. So the limit is x approaches negative 3. The numerator factors into x minus 3 and x plus 3. The denominator factors into x plus 3 and x minus 1. 
So the x plus 3 is canceled. So now I have the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x minus 3 over x minus 1. Now plug the negative 3 in. It gives me negative 6 over negative 4, which is 3 halves or 1.5. So don't be surprised if when you plug it in, you get a zero in the denominator. Because then I want to see your thought process. I want to see that you know I have to factor it, reduce it. Now I can plug it in and get the answer. So that is number five. Okay. The next one, number 12. Question number 12 has that square root in the numerator. You know, but it's possible that I can just take and plug this in. I do get a zero in the denominator, though. You know, so um, what do you do when you have a square root? What comes to mind? Not reciprocal. You want to come sit up here? <laughs> the conjugate, that's it. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by the conjugate, which is the square root of x plus 6 plus x, and the square root of x plus 6 plus x. So now the numerator always works out very nice on these. Okay, Multiply the first by first, you get x plus 6. The last by the last, you get uh, minus x squared. And the inside and outside all cancel. And then you still have your denominator, which is x cubed minus 3x squared. And we have the limit as x approaches 3. Let me um, kind of make some more room for myself right here. So I think I probably, maybe, oh, wait, wait, the denominator still has that. I left that other piece off. Times the square root of x plus 6 and then minus x. Now, in this numerator right here, it looks like, could I factor it in any way? Like, this is the same as negative x squared plus x plus 6. Or negative 1 times x squared minus x minus 6. So just the numerator. Negative 1 times x minus 3 times x plus 2. That's the numerator. Now the denominator. This part here I could factor an x squared out, giving me an x minus 3. And then I still have this nastiness, x plus 6 minus x. So you can see this one's a little more challenging with that square root. So see how the x minus 3 cancels? Yeah. Oh, it is a plus x. You're right. Thank you. That would change my answer for sure. All right. Thank you. Good catch. So now I have on. a little more room. Now I have the limit as x approaches 3 of negative 1 times x plus 2 over x squared times the square root of x plus 6 plus x. Now plug the 3 in. So on the top, I have negative 1 times 5, which is negative 5. On the bottom, I have 9 times the square root of 9, which is 3, plus x, which is 3. So I have negative 5 over 9 times 6, which is 54. When you have it that you plug the number in and the denominator is 0, you have to do something, you know, whether it's factoring, multiplying by the conjugate, so that something cancels. Once you get it to cancel, then you can plug it back in. But if you haven't found, like, I wouldn't plug it back in to this here, this over this, without factoring that and canceling something first. You have to cancel something before you plug it in. Okay? All right. And then, question number 15. This gives you a piecewise function that has three pieces. It has a line, 
a parabola and one of those little square root functions. It's like the little arm that comes out. So this one here says, and let me make sure I have it right here. This says as x approaches 5 from the right side and from the left side, and as x approaches 8 from the right side and from the left side. All right, so for this one, it's asking these four questions. What is the limit as it's approaching 5 from the right side? So I have to determine which one of these is the left side and which one's the right side. Well, x is less than 5, that's the left side of it, right? So I'm going to plug this 5 in for the left side. So I plug the 5 into that, and I get 10 for this one. Now for the right side, that's this one. That's from 5 to 8, so that's the right side of 5. So I plug the 5 into this, I get 5 plus 1, which is 6. 6 squared is 36. Because these limits are not the same, doesn't that mean it's not continuous? Right? So it's not continuous. A limit does not exist there truly, but from the left or right it does. Now I do the same thing with the 8. This is the left side of the 8, the right side of the 8. So the left side of the 8, when I plug the 8 in, 8 plus 1 is 9. 9 squared is 81. That's the left side. When I plug it into the right side, 8 plus 1 is 9. Square root of 9, 3. So this is definitely not a continuous function at x equals 5 and 8, though they didn't ask that here. This question was, you know, using limit notation, can you read limit notation? Questions on those there. So you can see you have three questions for that problem. Okay. All right, number four. Um, the epsilon delta definition, um, how are you guys doing with that? You have it memorized at this point? That's in the end, the good thing about it is once you memorize it, you, you kind of can spit it out. Now, in December, are you going to remember it again? Probably not because you memorized it, you know, but it, it, you re-memorize it then, I guess. But it's not going to be huge unless you're, like, really an analytic math major. So. We're going to have to, like, make the whole, like, no, no, I'm only giving you one that's linear, not one that's a parabola. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so part one of the proof. There's two parts to this proof, right? Part one, a few of you left this off on your take-home quiz, which I do plan on giving back to you today. You can keep those. Okay, and we start with let epsilon be greater than zero and delta be greater than zero. So that was worth two points on the take-home quiz. So if you didn't have that, you got two points marked off. So, you know, don't leave it off. All right. Then you say if, and that's where we focus on the x's here. Absolute value of x minus 4 is less than delta. Now, you could also have this greater than 0, but if you don't have this part, I will not mark you off because you already have deltas greater than 0 there. So you can have it or not. It doesn't matter. Oops. Oh, gosh, I'm doing the wrong class. Here we go. You guys are going to have to keep me in line all period. I am very tired today. <laughs> so x minus 3 less than delta. All right. Then, and then we use this part for the last part. Absolute value of 2x plus 5 minus negative 1 is less than epsilon. Is it a negative there? Yeah, oh, I can't even see it up here. That's why. Okay, it will be x plus 3. You're right. Thank you. I can't even see that. But there is a space there, so I could see what you're, what you're saying is that it's there. I believe you that it's there, but I can't see it. So that's the only reason why. <laughs> All right, and then we work with this right side here, right? And we try to transform this into this x plus 3. So let's see. We have plus positive right here, so we have absolute value of 2x plus 6 is less than epsilon. And it looks like they're both divisible by 2, so I could factor that out and get x plus 3 here. I would have picked up on it right there, that I couldn't get it as an x minus 3. Now the 
one on the take home quiz had a negative five that you factored out, right? That meant you would have had like an absolute value of negative five and an absolute value of x plus three. And the absolute value of negative five, you would have changed it to positive five. Okay, so some of you, that was another place I remember when I graded those last week, seeing that. And to get the x plus three by itself over on this side, we divide both sides by the two. And so now it looks like this, which means that delta is equal to epsilon over two. All right, then part two. You have to go all the way back to this. You can't go to this or this or this. You have to go all the way back to that first line. And so we start with that. Two absolute value of 2x plus 5 minus negative 1 <laughs> equals the absolute value of 2x uh, plus 6 equals 2 times the absolute value of x plus 3. And the absolute value of x plus 3 is equal to delta. That's what we had up there. Oh, actually, it's less than delta. And then we said, well, that's the same as if we plug in for delta, epsilon over 2, boop, boop, and we get our epsilon. So we have to end with epsilon. So that is your proof for using the epsilon delta definition to show that this limit does equal negative 1. And then the last question tomorrow looks like this. Let me just circle this so I make sure I do the right one. f of x equals x squared plus 7x minus 8. All right. Part A, find the slope of f of x at x equals 3. Okay, now I will tell you right now the same thing goes on the test. You can either start with the point 3 and then plug it into that, and then 3 plus h and plug it into that. Or you can start with x and x plus h to get the slope at 3. Okay. But when you come down here to part d, and it says find any points where the tangent of f of x is horizontal, you actually would have to do this again if you didn't do this part here in part a. So it is in your best interest to use this right here in part A so that you can use it in part D. Just a suggestion. You don't have to, but just saying. Okay. So when I plug my X in, I get X squared plus 7X minus 8. I plug my X plus H in, I get X plus H squared plus 7 times X plus H minus 8. So these are my two X's and Y's to find the slope. I use y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So it's the limit as h approaches 0 of, I'm going to square this now, x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Distribute the 7 plus 7x plus 7h minus 8. And then subtract this. So when I subtract this, I have to subtract each term. So minus x squared, minus 7x, and minus negative 8, which is plus 8. All divided by H. Things should cancel very nicely for you. So you have X squared minus X squared, negative 7X plus 7X plus 8 minus 8. And everything that I'm left with has, bless you, has an H. So I'm going to factor that out and save myself a line of work. 2X plus H plus 7. just cancel. So we have the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus h plus 7 and plug the 0 in you get 2x plus 7. So this here is f prime of x. This is the derivative. They in part a wanted to know the derivative at 3. So plug a 3 in. 6 plus 7, 13. This is the slope. B then says, write the equation of the tangent line at x equals 3. Well, you need a point and you need the slope, which right now you know the x value of the point is 3, and you know that the slope is 13, 
So in order to find the y value, you'd have to find what f of 3 is, which is 9 plus 21 minus 8, which is 30 minus 8, or 22. And then you plug into your point slope formula. y minus 22 equals m times x minus 3. I mean, you can solve for y if you want, but remember, <laughs> you make a mistake in here, it's algebra or arithmetic, and that's what you would be doing right there. Okay. Use algebra when you need to, only when you have to, not when you don't need to. Okay. And part C says to write the equation of the normal line. Well, I use the same point but I need the perpendicular slope. So what would the perpendicular slope be? Negative reciprocal, so negative 1 13th. So y minus 22 equals negative 1 13th times x minus 3. Your equation for your normal and your tangent look almost, almost identical. It's just the slope that's different. But then, of course, if you ever would distribute and combine like terms, then they look very different because then your z value, you know, Perpendicular lines are not going to cross the y-axis at the same place, you know, so they'll have different p values. All right, now, part D. Part D says, find the points where the tangent is horizontal, I think is the word, right? So if the tangent line is horizontal, I'm telling you the slope of it. What is the slope? Zero. Zero. So this is saying, where is the slope equal to zero? Where is f prime equal to zero? Isn't slope and f prime the same thing? Where is 2x plus 7 equal to zero? And so you get 2x equals negative 7. That means x is negative 7 halves. That only gives you the x value. Keyword, and some of you mess up on this on your take-home quiz. Keyword, you got to write it as a point. Not just the x value. So I need x squared plus 7x minus 8. F of x equals x squared plus 7x minus 8. Okay. I need to find what f of negative 7 halves is. Remember, this is the non-calculator portion of the test. So are you better with decimals or are you better with fractions? I can tell you when you have to square something, a fraction is easier to square than a decimal. So when I have to square this, negative 7 times negative 7 is 49, and 2 times 2 is 4. Okay. And then 7 times this, that means 7 times negative 7 is negative 49, and 1 times 2 is 2. I don't multiply top and bottom by 7. That's another <laughs> and then minus 8. I would need some common denominators right there. So common denominator here would be 4. This one's already a 4. This one I'd have to multiply top and bottom by 2 to get it a 4. And this one I'd have to multi multiply top and bottom by 4 to get it to be 4. So... 49 minus 98 is negative 49, and then minus that 32 is negative 81. If it reduces, reduce it. If not, you know, just leave it. Negative 81 fourths. So someone else will say, well, can I have negative 3.5 and 20, negative 20.25? Absolutely, because you're just a decimal person. That's fine. I have nothing against you. You don't have to be a, a fraction person. You can be a decimal person. Okay. In my years of math, I've learned that fractions are easier to work with than decimals. All right. So that right there is what your test looks like tomorrow. What do you think?